Stanford University. Well, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, research projects that I use in teaching, and I'm actually going to talk about ants. So you'll get to hear about ants, because when I talk about research, I always talk about ants. Um, I see here um, one of um, Aaron Sunshine in the back there, who is one of the, um, I think, did you take sophomore college and a sophomore seminar? Uh, a sophomore, right. So um, Aaron is one of the, the people who has experienced this process that I'm going to tell you about, and so he can actually probably tell you much more about what it's like to be on the student end than I can. So I thought that um, before I tell you some of the details of the kinds of research projects that we do, I wanted to say a little bit about why I do it um, and what it means to me to teach in this way. So I think of research, the kind of research I do, as a procedure for deciding what's true. Um, and What's important to me as a teacher is to give students a sense of what this process is, where do the things that we know uh, scientifically, where do they come from, how do we find out things, what does it take to find out things, and that to me seems much more important than delivering the outcome of research as a kind of a finished package and asking students just to accept it. And um, for me, it's uh, especially appropriate to be talking about this today um, on Inauguration Day, which is for me a very sad and frightening day, um, precisely because um, I feel that um, the Bush administration um, represents uh, a, an attitude towards what's true, which is really upsetting to me, namely that not only that it doesn't matter what's true, but that they have relied on millions of people also not caring what's true. You know, were there weapons of mass destruction or were there not weapons of mass destruction? That's a question that actually has an answer. There is a truthful answer to that question. And I guess I feel that as a teacher in the U.S. in 2005, maybe the best that I can contribute to um, the future citizens of this country is a sense that it really does matter what's true, and that we have a way of finding out. And uh, that that way of finding out actually can be applied very broadly to all kinds of questions. So um, leaving aside the very big picture to the particulars, I want to take you through um, the different kinds of research projects that I'm engaged in as a teacher, um, which I consider to be you know, overlapping but sort of separate from the work that I do is my own research. So at one end of um, the ways in which I'm involved with students as a teacher, there are the research projects that my graduate students are doing that I bring um, undergraduates with me to do in the field. And I'm not really going to talk about that today because um, really in those situations, the students are with me doing the research that I do as a researcher. And somehow at the other end of the scale, and um, there isn't really a, a very distinct line between these, but at the other end of the scale are research projects that are created for the purpose of teaching. Um, and so I'm going to start at that end and talk about the um, research projects. Uh, uh, well, um, so different kinds of projects where, first of all, um, I want to tell you about the um, projects that students in a lecture course I teach called Behavioral Ecology. Um, they spend a quarter uh, doing these projects independently. Each student does their own project. And the whole project is a self-contained um, process, um, which is an assignment for the class. It's born out of um, they're having to do the assignment. It's done at the end of the quarter. Um, that's the end of it. So that's um, one kind of very self-contained project that students do in a lecture course. And then there's kind of a range of group projects that I've been involved in. Um, one, um, the first is to contribute to an ongoing lab project. Um, then there are projects that we do in courses but which have evolved over the last five years or so into year-to-year -year projects. So we continue them from one time I give the course to the next time I give the course. We keep going on the same project. And then, um, uh, as I said, research assistants that come out with me for summer field work, well, sometimes these are um, P 
people that are only going to spend a summer knowing, really just trying to find out what research is like. And um, it's a learning experience for them, and they're helping my research. But it isn't exactly um, really just a teaching experience. So unless people have questions about that, I'm not going to talk so much about that. Um, but there is one um, really important principle for me that underlies all of this, it, which is that I think it's really important that student research asks genuine questions. Um, it really disturbs me to see people giving students projects in class or projects to do as part of their um, classwork where the answer is already known. I think that that's um, a really inauthentic um, experience and um, uh, the kinds of lab exercises where somebody um, makes up something for students to do and um, we already know the right answer and then you ask them if they got the right answer. I just basically really object to that as a way of teaching. So I think it's really important when students take on research projects that um, everybody understands that they are embarking on a process to get an answer. We don't know the answer yet and the answer we get is going to be the outcome of their work. So it has to be a, a real question. So in my um, behavioral ecology course, which fluctuates wildly through the years, um, I've had 20 students, I've had 120 students. It's a lecture course, and then we have seminar sections with 15 to 20 students. And in the course of this um, seminar, which I never call a section, because that evokes um, thoughts of the bio core and um, the experience of sections in the bio core. So I never ever say the word section. I always say seminar. And what we do in the seminar is we go through, basically we read um, journal articles and we go through the steps of this project. So it's a 10 week project um, and every week the students have to turn in uh, their work so far, the step for that week. And these um, assignments are not graded. You, don't, you get a lot of points for turning them all in on time, but you don't get a grade for doing it. You just have to do it. Um, but you, don't, um, you can't do it better or worse. You, you, either you do it or you don't do it. Uh, so the first thing that we ask them to do is to choose some animal and set up an observation schedule. Um, and uh, through the years, this has ranged from um, lizards in the window of a pet store to um, I, my rule about um, pets is that it can't be just a single animal. You can't work with your own dog or your own cat because then what you're really looking at is the interaction between you and the animal. But if you have more than one of whatever it is, if you have two dogs or two cats or two goldfish, um, that's fine. So any non-human animal. Um, and I ask them first of all to set up an observation schedule um, so they have to be available to um, observe this animal for or animals for two hours per week. Um, the second week, um, they just have to turn in the notes they've taken on the behavior that they've observed. So I work very hard to um, deal with the terror that students experience when they're starting a project that they don't know what they're going to do and they don't know if they're going to get the right answer and they don't know quite what they're supposed to do and just persuade them that it's going to be okay, we're going to take you through this, just go out and find an animal and just watch it and you don't have to know what you're doing yet. And then finally by the third week, so after three weeks of this observation, they have to come up with a question. And here I tell them that um, it doesn't really matter if the question is silly. Um, they can't really hope in a 10-week course to really push back the frontiers of knowledge on um, the behavior of this animal. Um, it could be, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some questions, but you know, it could be do the squirrels run more in the morning than the afternoon? Do the ducks um, swim faster on Tuesdays than Thursdays? You know, they don't really want to. Uh, they try hard to come up with a question that has some meaning for them. And what I'm really hoping they will do is to extract the question out of their observations. So um, what we try to do, and I work with the TAs on this, is um, to help them Usually what happens is the students go out and watch and then they come back and they ask the TAs, you know, I saw the um, jays um, in the palm trees and they were sort of, you know, flapping their wings and what were they doing? And then we say, well, there's a question that you could ask in your project. So we try to um, help them take the questions that naturally come up when you watch animals and turn it into a, a project, uh, a question for their project. 
And so by the third week, they have to decide what, how they're collecting data. And this is where we introduce the idea that, for example, you can't answer a question about what Js do in the afternoon if you only look in the morning, that there's going to be some relationship between how you collect the data and what you can find out. And then um, the fourth week, they have to tell us in detail how they're collecting data. Um, by the fifth week, they have to take their question and make it into a quantitative hypothesis, not just what are the jays doing when they're flapping their wings, but do they flap their wings more um, when they're going up than down. They have to somehow make it into a question that has numbers for an answer. And then they have to um, turn in their data so far. Then they have to explain the statistical test they will use, and this is actually usually the most um, difficult part for the students who tend to be mostly juniors, and they've only really come from the bio core. They may have had um, one statistics course, or they may not, but we um, uh, encourage them very strongly to keep it simple. And in the final paper, they have to explain why they use that test. So we um, really, um, what I don't want them to do is to go on the computer and find you know, try their data in 15 different tests, and if they get a p-value out, just turn it in so that um, I want to make sure that they understand how the statistical test that they're using actually answers their question. Um, but they don't really need to understand the whole, um, uh, everything about that test. And then they have to write up the results, and I give them a very clear format for that paper. And the idea is that they can use all of these assignments so far and put them together to make the final paper because they will have already been through, um, they will have already written down how they're collecting the data and um, they will have tabulated the data. And so really the last step for preparing the final paper is only to figure out um, what the results mean. Did they get more wing flapping in the morning or in the afternoon? Um, what's the answer to their question? So um, it's interesting to me how um, actually a lot of the same questions come, um, uh, come year after year. Um, I'd say the vast majority of people work either on birds or on squirrels. Um, a lot of people are interested in the behavior of squirrels in response to people. Um, it's also sort of interesting to me that there's always this comparison between the black and the gray squirrels, although they're the same species, but people are always um, wanting to show that the, the they're different according to their color, when in fact they, are, um, they aren't. Um, there, some t years where they're, um, I do this in the spring quarter. I used to do it in the fall, but um, it's often the, the projects would be interrupted by the rain, so I've moved it to the spring. And depending on how much water there is in Lake Lag, they may um, work on ducks. So whether I get duck projects depends on the weather. So um, basically, the point of this is to take everybody through the process of doing a research project. As I say, they don't. Um, some people do really amazing projects, but um, it's uh, rare that somebody does something that um, answers a question that nobody's really um, ever addressed before anywhere in the literature. Um, I discourage them, although we read a lot of journal articles, I discourage them from reading a lot of journal articles until the end, because I want their question to come out of what they see. And um, I think uh, this whole process of going through the research project, I think, is the best way to teach people how to read journal articles. Because once they have been through the steps, um, not only can they appreciate when they read a journal article and somebody says, you know, I have 568 hours of observations on these elephants, they have a better feel for what that means. But, on, but also, they have a much better feel for how the whole thing works and, and how you get from um, watching animals to saying something new about their behavior. So um, I think that this, this process of doing research, this research project, um, even though it's really pretty small in scope, uh, is really the best way to give students an introduction to reading journal articles of their, uh, on their own. And we do that separately in class. OK, so next I want to tell you about some of the group projects that we do. And yeah. All those steps you mentioned, the first one, wasn't really uh, graded as such, so you can do it or not do it. Is that true for all? Was it seven? The, uh, the final um, paper is graded. So I don't remember now. Um, I don't see anybody here who's taking my class. I can't remember. Some proportion of their grade is just turning in these steps. And really, um, we do that because um, if the 
This is not the kind of thing that you can do all at once in the last week of the quarter. So you have to do it. You have to keep going. But then they get, a, then their final report is graded. So um, along the way, they have a chance to work with me or the TA on some step that they don't understand. Uh, um, if they turn in one of the steps along the way and it's not really good enough, then we say, you know, you need to work on this and we get it to where it needs to be so that by the time they come to write it up, they should have it all together. And um, almost everybody does a really good job on their, their final project. So um, uh, the other part of grading in the course is, is um, weekly essays. So instead of exams, they also write about the articles that they're reading. <coughs> Other questions? So group projects. Well, um, the first kind of project uh, that I want to tell you a little bit about is an ongoing project that's been, uh, we've now for 12 years been monitoring um, the Argentine ants. Those are the ones that were in your kitchen last week and I hope are leaving for the last day or two. Um, they're a, an invasive species. They came from Argentina and they um, are moving into Jasper Ridge, which is a reserve that Stanford owns um, down on Sand Hill Road. Uh, and we've been keeping track of how the Argentine ants are moving in to Jasper Ridge and kind of closing in from the edges. So um, Argentine ants are encouraged by human disturbance. Um, they're in your house because it's nice and warm in your house and it's cold and wet outside. So wherever there are people, there are more Argentine ants and Jasper Ridge is surrounded by um, human development. And so the, um, now the Argentine ants are moving into this uninhabited area um, because they've been encouraged by um, the houses around it. So there's the Argentine ant. Um, I know that all of you have seen them. Uh, if it's in your house, that's who it is. And um, just to tell you a little bit about this survey, um, what we've done is to uh, divide our uh, Jasper Ridge into um, points basically 100 meters apart and twice a year we go around to all these places and look to see what ants are there. And so this is something that undergraduates can do with us. Um, what we do is ask for a commitment of two surveys So because the first time the person isn't really much help. They um, have to learn to distinguish Argentine ants from other ants and um, basically how to sort of get down on your hands and knees and look around for ants. And um, so anybody can learn to do that in a few days, but um, they don't really contribute very much the first time. So we do this twice a year in September and May. And um, we ask students if they sign on for one to make a commitment to do the next one. And so we've had this kind of um, w usually three or four students every time, this kind of rolling um, contingent of students over the years. Um, and several graduate students have done their theses on, on these data. So um, here's a, just a picture to show you what's happening. Um, so these are sort of the results. And um, what happens is that students may migrate from these group projects onto honors research. So some students get really interested in what's happening with the ants at Jasper Ridge. And instead of just doing this task that we basically give them, um, they, they develop a further independent project. And, um, again, I, you know, I don't really know how to draw the line, but I don't really see that as exactly a teaching tool. That's teaching students how to do research as opposed to using research as a way of teaching them other things. So, I mean, that's a distinction that I, you know, I don't really want to make too much of, but I, I kind of divide things up into, into diff those different categories. So, um, I want to tell you now, though, about class projects where really these are um, projects which are designed to ask a question that we really want to know the answer to, but it's also a way of teaching a class. So it's using the research project as the basis for teaching a class. Um, and I've done this in sophomore college and in sophomore seminars, um, which I guess are called introductory seminars. Um, and the first one, um, the first kind of project I want to tell you about is again about these Argentine ants. And we've been looking now over several years at the distribution of um, Argentine ants and native ants on campus. So again, this ant, the Argentine ant has been um, in California for about 100 years, but it's only in the last 30 or 40 years as the California coastline has become more developed that they have really swept through, become established, and are pretty much wiping out all the native ants. 
So there are, um, on the California coastline now, they are up to sort of around Chico, um, Sacramento area, um, all the way down into Baja, so all the way down. Um, there are very few places where there are um, people where you can still find native ants. So the native ants are kind of now, um, you know, huddled um, in a few pockets and places where um, there isn't so much development. And so we've been interested in using Stanford campus as a place to look around and see how this invasion is progressing here. And this is um, the result of an enormous amount of work by um, Patrick Shea, uh, whose name is kind of, he put his little copyright symbol up there. So he did this as a, um, not an honors project, but uh, his um, senior project in Earth Systems. And he went around, and um, this is the Argentine ants. So where there are red dots, there are Argentine ants. And then when you see any other color, um, that means that some native species has managed to persist. And um, this was surprising, you know, I thought when he started this that he wouldn't find any native ants anywhere. But in fact, um, there are a couple of areas where there still are quite a few native ants, um, mostly up around the, I don't have a pointer, but up there, up around the mausoleum and over in there, like where they have the powwow, um, up there. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of native ants left, and if you think about those areas, those are areas where there's still a lot of trees and there aren't any big buildings, and um, the native ants are still hanging on in a few places in campus. And so now, um, over the last three years, I guess, I've, um, with several classes, been looking more at the details of this. Um, are there certain seasons, for example, in which the Argentine ants are more abundant? Um, this ant Prenolepis in Paris is a really unusual ant in that it can come out when it's cold. Most ants, like most insects, they're not um, warm-blooded. They can't adjust their body temperature. So most ants can't move when they're cold. But Prenolepis in Paris has some special enzymes that make it possible to move around when it's cold. And the Argentine ants, as you notice, when it's cold, they don't like it either. That's why they're, they're there in your house. Um, and so we think that maybe... Um, there are times when the Prenolepis can actually withstand the Argentine ant because um, when it's really cold and the Argentine ant can't do much, the Prenolepis can be out collecting food. So there are these seasonal changes in um, when the Argentine ants are most um, abundant. And so in successive years with different classes, we've been surveying especially the area around the mausoleum looking at the effect of seasons, because I teach different classes in different seasons, and the change from one year to the next. So um, this is just a, a map that's been evolving over time. Here's the angel of grief. And um, here we have these maps now of all these trees, and it says what kind of tree it is, and we have mapped out that whole region. And students have been going back to the same trees um, year after year and looking at different times and looking to see when... Um, uh, what ants are there. Uh, and this is something that's pretty easy for anybody to learn in, in the course of a few days um, to identify the different ants. And um, what I've been um, working on, I guess, myself as a teacher is ways to make links between the work of classes of different generations. And one of the things that's been really helpful is that um, previous students, so um, because the students in sophomore college and the students in the sophomore seminar are um, sophomores, they're around for a while after they've done this. And so um, there have now been several students who have worked, um, have been in the class who have then come back to um, be teaching assistants in sophomore college or who have just um, signed on for research to be the sort of um, teaching assistant when they're juniors or seniors for the sophomore seminar. Um, instead of getting paid because we don't do it that way, we instead they join in as a research project, and so the people who did the, who did the project as part of the class when they were younger come back when they are a couple of years older to be the um, um, person who, who deals with the question of making sure that we collect the data in exactly the same way the same, um, in successive times so that we can um, compare it. And um, I now have a student who's a senior who's doing her honors thesis on uh, looking at the data from the last three years and um, putting that together. And I think that we now have learned enough about it to write a manuscript that we, um, I mean, it's kind of a funny question, do we put 
you know, five classes on as authors of the manuscript, or I'm not sure what we'll do about that. But um, uh, anyway, now we've, we've actually learned something. And so um, one of the things that uh, sort of concerns me about this is that um, I'm the one who's, who's learning the most, because I'm the one who's there through all of it. And I think um, what I'm starting to think more and more about is how, um, what are the ways that I can um, bring together the different generations of work so that the students at any one time can really benefit from being part of this ongoing project. Uh, and we don't really have any um, institutional means of bringing different classes of different years together. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of interaction just sort of informally between students of one time and students um, a couple of years down the line. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we do in all of these classes is ask people to summarize um, their results. So the students working in the, in the project in a particular class, um, part of what they do at the end of the quarter is to present to the class their results on their section that they've been monitoring. And um, uh, what we're starting to do now is to ask those students, now that we've begun to tabulate the data over time, also to uh, themselves look at the data from previous classes and try to um, make an evaluation about the difference between the results that they got in this quarter when they were doing the work and the results the previous students got. And so I think that over time, um, we will try to develop um, more standardized ways of um, tabulating the data. This last time, for the first time, I said, OK, everybody's going to make an Excel spreadsheet that looks just like this. And you put this in this column so that students of successive years can um, work more easily with the data from before. And then um, the last kind of project I want to tell you about is one that we just started this past year in sophomore college, but um, we're going to go on with this. And um, you'll be seeing these little red ants all over the place, so um, I'll tell you about that. Um, so um, some researchers actually working um, over at Clorox to develop pesticides discovered by accident that um, these Argentine ants, when fed a certain kind of cockroach, um, smell different and are attacked by other ants. So um, by accident, a lab tech fed them the wrong kind of cockroach, this weird German cockroach. And it seems that when these ants eat this cockroach, um, they take on the weird smell of the cockroach. And they smell so different from the rest of the ants that the other ants attack them. So um, this is pretty interesting to people who think about Argentine ants, because one of the strange things about Argentine ants is that um, different colonies don't seem to fight with each other. And um, so what we started in sophomore college last year was um, trying experimentally to create these ant wars um, by feeding Argentine ants on campus in certain locations, um, ants that had been fed these cockroaches. And what we did was to feed them at the same time. And this is a fun thing you can do in your own kitchen if you want. Um, if you feed ants. Um, uh, sugar water with a lot of food coloring in it, when they eat, they swell up a little bit. And you can see in between the segments of their abdomen, and you can see that color. So um, if you um, care to do this in your kitchen sink, um, or uh, what we did was to feed the ants, the cockroaches also fed them red sugar water. And we actually continued this through the fall. And uh, we're just about to, well, um, in April, we will start again. So you may be seeing lots of little red ants wandering around. So um, you can turn the ants those little ants bright red by feeding them um, sugar water with, with red food coloring in it. So we fed the ants um, in sophomore college. I did it um, because we didn't really know much about how to do it. These experiments um, that were published were all done in the lab. And what I really would like to know is, um, can you create massive wars um, between these ants who normally don't fight if you can create some parts of the population that's, that have the wrong smell? Um, so that's a, that's a real question, which um, would actually be very interesting to a lot of people who think about invasions. And what we did um, in, in sophomore college is a way of sort of trying to tap the creativity of the students um, in, um, to get to answers to this question is we just gave them the methods, and we didn't tell them what to do. We said, OK, here's the roach. Here's how you make red ants. 
Um, we know how long it takes for an ant to, to smell funny. Um, there's so much we don't know about this. Um, go ahead. And they um, were divided into groups of three or four, and um, everybody, each group had to do their own project, and they designed their own projects, and they did really different things. And um, um, as always, they did really interesting things. Um, so this is one group that just was looking at the question of um, uh, how long would the smell last? So they had their um, dyed ants in this in here, and then they would watch them leave, and then they wanted to know how long would it be before this smell wore off and they wouldn't be attacked anymore. And then we continued this experiment um, with other students not in a class um, over this fall, which was kind of cut short by the fact that it got cold and started raining so soon, and um, we're going to start again in April. But this is, a, this is an experiment that we're going to continue. Um, uh, we had some of the students um, from sophomore college joined in, and then I taught a, a sophomore seminar this fall. And some of them chose, I gave them a choice between working on this Ant Wars experiment or working on the survey at the mausoleum. And so some did one, some did the other. And um, uh, we didn't really succeed in creating massive Ant Wars. But as I say, I think um, that's because uh, it takes time to build up enough ants that have eaten this stuff. and then when it starts getting wet the ants go and, and cold the ants go in so i don't think i think what happened to us this year actually is that we just um it got cold before we had enough ants yeah so huh. like well um it's been argued that um the reason that the argentine ants are so successful is that they don't fight and this has always seemed kind of silly to me um I mean, to me, it's like saying the reason I'm alive is no piano ever fell on my head. You know, um, if they were to fight a lot, so, so the argument goes, well, if they were to fight a lot, then they would kill each other, and then there wouldn't be so many of them. And so the reason we, don't ha we have so many is because they don't, they don't fight. Well, I, um, I don't know about that, but one could get at that empirically by saying, well, okay, what if they did fight? Would you really see, you know, could we develop these zones on campus? Of course, I really wanted to do it in the quad because um, it's so easy to map the ants there. And um, that's another project that um, we've done in sophomore college that I'm not telling you about. But what I, you know, my fantasy is to create a group of ants all around some very um, well-defined area on campus that all have the wrong smell and see if there develops this zone around that area of um, no ants because all the ants on one team have fought with the ants on the other team and they, you know, there would be a no ant zone in between. Um, the trouble with the quad is that every time there's some big equation, that, uh, sorry, e occasion where um, people want things to look nice, they go around and spray the quad and so that ruins the, the whole thing. So um, uh, we're, we're instead choosing areas where we feel um, um, that there isn't that much traffic. So we have chosen a few places where we're going to try and cultivate um, populations of ants that have this cockroach smell. So I guess um, I will stop there by um, trying to uh, outline the, the themes of, of the ways that I use research and teaching. Um, the first is that, um, like I said, I think it's really important that the students answer genuine questions, that we not set students working, um, working to find out things that somebody already knows, um, because I think that's, that's dishonest and wasting their time. And um, the whole point is to show them what it takes to really find out something. Um, and another thing, um, just maybe because of the nature of the kind of projects that we're doing, because I'm an ecologist and because work in ecology takes um, usually many years um, to get an answer because there's always effects of changes in the weather and the ways that this year is different from last year. So I tend to do things that last many years and that's ideal for building on the work of previous classes and it's um, just come about that in the course of doing that I've noticed that it's, um, it's a great thing to get older students involved with younger students um, working together. So that I, I think that's really beneficial all around. Um, and uh, 
there's always a kind of trade-off between letting the students design the project, um, which means that they will come up with ideas that I don't have and um, do really interesting things and also get a feel for designing the project, and the constraints of a year-to-year -year project where if everybody does everything in a different way every year, you can't have that continuity. On the other hand, if I completely tell them what to do, then they are, they're not really having a chance to make mistakes and um, figure out why you should do it this way rather than that way. So there's a kind of a tension there between um, um, trying to develop projects that have some continuity year to year and trying in every way possible to give students a chance to um, make up their own projects. And maybe there are people here who have ideas about that that I'd like to hear about. Yeah. You mentioned that you don't want students to answer questions that are to which uh, the answer is already known. Yeah. But uh, you're saying that you also said that people ask the same questions year after year, and so uh, there seems to be some. I don't. I'm not quite understanding what you mean by that. Uh, well, because we don't have the answers yet. Um, something about black squirrels and gray squirrels being different, and that question seems to be answered in your mind, but yet students are asking that. Well, that's true. That's true. But I don't um, give that question to them. You see, um, it's true that in the, um, it's definitely true that in the um, uh, class projects where they have just the one quarter and they invent their own projects, that students do tend to come up with the same question year after year. And um, uh, they don't always get the same answers, but um, some of the questions that they ask, I do already know the answers to. Um, but in these, um, year-to-year -year class projects, we are asking the same question year-to-year, -year, but we don't know the answer. It takes many years to get the answer. So they're, they're kind of joining in on, some, on a multi-year project for a short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. How do you see your approach to teaching being translated into other disciplines where the questions, uh, the research itself might take a lot of equipment or it might involve a lot more advanced knowledge which undergraduates don't have and so it seems to me that your field is something that is something that uh, students at all levels can participate in yep. um, without so much knowledge. Right, well you know I kind of make it sound that way. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot that I know about ants that the students don't know um, and really what I try to do is to figure out what are the kinds of things that they can genuinely do without knowing anything. Um, it's uh, another version of that is when I take students to um, my field site in Arizona where I've been going now for 20 years. And, um, you know, in the beginning I used to take the students out there and tell them all about the ants, you know, and I'd spend days saying this ant is doing this and this ant is doing this. And over time I've just given up that and I um, put them out there and I tell them what they need to know to do the task, the first task, and let them ask questions. Because, um, so I think um, the whole, um, for me learning to work with students in research has been a process of learning to pare away at the amount of stuff that I tell them in advance and just try to figure out what do they need to do to genuinely engage in this question, what do they need to know, and just leave all the rest of it out. And I don't know exactly how that translates to other fields. I mean, I, you know, the worst version of that is um, if it's something using equipment where you take the student in and say, just pour this stuff into here, press that button, you know, write down the number it says. Of course you have to, if, if, you, if the person doesn't understand why they're doing it, it it's useless. Um, so that's another one of those things where there's a tension between in telling, them, uh, telling them a lot of stuff just before they start, which just becomes more information that they swallow without question, and having them do something mindlessly without understanding why. So somehow that's the real problem is to figure out how much do you really have to tell them so that they know what they're doing but you don't want to tell them anything more than they ha you have to because otherwise you're just lecturing to them. Um, so it's hard. It's hard. And I don't really know how it translates to other fields. 
um, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of um, things about research that are dictated just by the rhythm of um, how, how long it takes to get an answer and in what way um, the next question follows from the last one. And so I think that would be really different in different fields. Yeah. I have a question about motivation. Like for the class that lasts only one quarter, I don't know if it's an elective student uh, uh, have to take it, but suppose they have to take it. How do you uh, you know, go about motivating them to ask the interesting question, and not the most obvious and not the simplest, you know, to do the least amount of work? How do you generate motivation? Well, um, uh, my behavioral ecology class is um, on a, a track. It satisfies a requirement, but it isn't. It, it isn't something that everybody has to take. And um, I try hard in the beginning of the class to tell them what they're in for. And so that they, um, I try not to ha put people through this who don't want to be there. And then I think if you, um, if people are at all interested, but I, you know, I, I have to say that um, I always get people who don't like it. I had an evaluation at sophomore college last time um, the main thing I learned from this is I never want to have anything to do with research. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's fair enough. Um, but uh, I think if the more that the person um, has to develop the question themselves, the more investment they have in it. So um, with the class project, I think what gets people involved is um, undergoing the experience of sitting around watching an animal and not knowing what they're doing. And it's really um, difficult for some students to have to um, be doing some work and not know exactly how they're going to get the right answer. Um, so it's, it's kind of upsetting. But I think going through that is um, once they get to their question, they have this big investment because they, they suffered to get their question, you see? Because they had to sit there or be somewhere um, watching animals and not knowing why they were doing it. And um, from there, they get interested in the animal. And from there, they get to their question. And that's the trajectory that gets them engaged. But I don't want to say that I think that everybody does it. You know, um, So I don't know. I don't have a foolproof way of making, it, making people. Uh, I definitely don't have any way of making people like it. <laughs> Um, people like it if, if they're going to like it, yeah. Virginia. Uh, I, th I thought for your behavioral ecology class that all the steps were admirably well compacted into a quarter system. Yeah. But I wondered if you had, if you were teaching on a semester and you had 15 weeks, yeah. what part of that process would you lengthen? What would you give more to? Oh, I'd, I'd definitely give more to the beginning um, to coming up with the question because I think if they had more time to um, learn about the animals that they're watching. Uh, I mean, from watching. If they spent more time watching, they would have more interesting questions. So I, um, I, it could easily be stretched out. Uh, the thing about a semester is that the weather changes. What? Do you spend much time on the writing part, on uh, helping them through, like, first drafts of their writing or anything like that? Well, the, the weekly assignments are the first drafts. And they figure that out about halfway through the quarter. And so then they come back for help with, with fixing that up. Um, and the writing, um, I give them a very, very detailed instructions about what to write. And I tell them in writing that paper that there is a difference, there is a real difference between writing this, this final report for this class and the papers that they're reading in class, which is that they don't really have to justify why it's interesting relative to what else is known in the field about that, because that that's a different project, really. That means reading what everybody else has said and figuring out who's on whose side. And um, they, we do that with the journal articles we're reading, but I don't ask them to do that with their project. And maybe, again, if I had more time, that would be something they could do. We ask them at the end to find one article on the species that they're studying and to come to um, seminar and talk about it. And then often what happens is that um, half of them find an article that says X and the other half find an article that says Y and then they have a chance to, to disagree, as like about this issue about the colors of the squirrels. Um, uh, so um, I think I would, I would probably stretch that out more too and have them um, learn more about what everybody else says about what they did. 
Michelle. I was curious about the impact on your time of this approach. You mentioned that as students go through the different steps, if any of them are having problems, that you and the TAs work with them and make sure they uh, are doing what they should at each step. So what, what sort of time consequences does this approach have for you? It sounds like it could be pretty intensive. Well, I think it's, it's um, everything about that course um, is much more time intensive in the beginning because in the beginning they're, they're worried. Um, but I would say in the, about the fifth week of the quarter, everybody settles down. They know what they're doing. They understand what they have to do, and we get much less um, um, people worried about it. And um, I don't know. There seem to me to be sort of unexplained fluctuations from year to year in how um, uh, scary we appear to be to the students. Uh, you know, some years, um, some years we're flooded with people, some years we're not, and I really don't know why that is. Uh, there's another thing we do in that course, which is um, we have a debate about um, a sort of controversial topic in the field, and another um, sort of similar phenomenon I can't explain is that um, almost always all the different sections come to the same conclusion in the debate. One, you know, one year they all go one way, another year they all go the other way. And I always think, well, where does that come from? Is it that this year I sort of sounded a little more in favor of this side or that side, or, or is it something in the air, you know? Um, so some years we have a lot more um, people worried about how to do it than others, and I don't really know why. Yeah? Does this class work particularly well with sophomores, or would you pick freshmen, juniors? Is, is there any particular age? college that this works well like over others? Um, I think that uh, the, my, my lecture course with the project is juniors and seniors. Um, and that's because um, it just so, ha turns out that the uh, people take the biology core as sophomores and so they're not ready um, till they're juniors. So that's, um, sometimes I take people who concurrently with the BioCore because the, the section, the, the um, quarter on evolution happens to be at the same time as my course. And sometimes if somebody really wants to, I have a sophomore in the course. And I don't really notice much difference. I don't think, um, although I think it's hard here for, for a sophomore bio major to um, at the same time talk about journal articles and about why some people have this opinion and other people have that opinion at the same time that the BioCore is throwing so much information on them that they just have to absorb. And so I think for some of them there's this kind of dissonance if they go to the BioCore and then they come to me and I say, well, you know, some people think this, but some people think that. And it's really hard for them to put that together. So um, I think in that way um, that course is maybe better for older students. The, um, Introductory seminars, you know, I had this year some freshmen um, for the first time, and I don't think that worked very well. Um, so I've always taught it for sophomores. So um, just because it was in the fall, I think first course when you come to Stanford, um, somehow sort of wandering around looking at ants on trees, it's just not, um, uh, they, they, they maybe want more structure and more very clear, you know, I do this, this is the outcome. I think maybe it, it was kind of overwhelming for freshmen. So I'm thinking that I will, um, but sophomores, I think it's kind of a relief. They've been here a year and then they get to do something a little different and, um, well, maybe Aaron can tell us about that, but, but it seems to me that um, sophomores are fine with, with that kind of class research project. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.